tinfoil hat. Oh, what the fuck are you guys even talking about? Global controls will have to be imposed. And a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Welcome to Tinfoil Hat. We, we, we go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Good morning, Swarm, and welcome to Tim Fall Hat. You know I am. You know I'm here to. I'm here to. Rawr! Joining me as always, Xavier Guerrero, and on the ones and two, Jay Nice, Juicy Johnny, Johnny Wooder. Okay. Bow, 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 bow. okay, guys, real quick before we get into it, just go to samtriplee.com. Check out all the events. Uh, Friday night, I'm in Pottstown, uh, at headlining Soul Joel's, then Skank Fest, then Morris Plains. New Jersey on October 13th. Just added Thousand Oaks. Woo. October 19th. Grab those tickets, and we're going to be having some comedy chaos. Just book Russell Peters. We have a great lineup already. Go to SamTriplee.com for all the Sam Triple needs, and we're in it. Very excited to have this next guest on. Uh, we have watched her from afar, which sounds creepier than it is. Uh, I'm a fan of hers on Instagram, and she's got a great podcast called The Chiller Queen podcast please welcome to tim foha avery warner how are you i am wonderful thank you so much for having me on sam this is a this is a dream come true i have been wanting to come on this podcast for a long time i've been listening to you well before i was ever podcasting so this is kind of surreal i this, love it this is great and i appreciate the kind words and i'm glad we could get you on we've been trying to make this happen for a little while uh, for those who may not be familiar with you, Avery, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where our listeners can find you? So a lot of people might know me um, from the reality television show, 90 Day Fiance, before the 90 Days, season four, if you want to watch my shit show of a love story. Um, but basically, once I went on television, I mean, it, my show aired in 2020 and uh, once it went on television, you know, we had the pandemic and we were all isolated in our houses. And that's kind of when I started awakening to, you know, some of the crazy corruption going on in this world. I guess you could say I got red pilled. Um, and, you know, during that time, I had kind of like a promising career uh, in television because I had a lot more shows in line coming up. But I started speaking out mm -hmm. against some of the stuff that just wasn't sitting right with me. And it wasn't going along with the usual narrative. And so, uh, you know, I, you know, that ended up me getting me canceled off of television, which kind of pushed me into mm -hmm. doing my own thing, which led me down this whole rabbit hole of trying to figure out what the hell is going on I here. I love it. And so that's what kind of pushed me to create my podcast. And so that my listeners can kind of go on this journey with me of trying to, you know, figure out, you know, the nature of reality. Like, I what love the hell it. is going on here? Uh, hold on. I, so I'm, I'm not the uh, Johnny. Are you a 90 day fiance guy? I know that Jason Tebow and a bunch of them. Yeah. Are. Yeah. We have a little text thread about it. Yeah. <laughs> now I don't watch it a lot. I've watched it here and there, but you don't seem like the 90 day fiance person. Usually they're yeah. like, they look like cafeteria ladies. It's all <laughs> kinds of people. No, it's all kinds of people. Really? Oh yeah. And yeah, then they yeah. just, they're starting, to, they're starting to bring out a lot more like, uh, not the typical, like super old woman with the random young dude who's, catfishing her from afar which like. i have no problems with by the way i i talk about all the time i don't know why they're women in their late 30s 40s 50s don't get green card dick i've been saying that forever <laughs> there's no, I, I don't know why we're okay with older guys getting like japanese bitches but then we get upset we think it's weird when it goes the other way around i have zero problems with it yeah, do whatever you want get some action yeah. man. you've worked hard I mean, as long as you're not doing it for a green card, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm cool like, that I'm doing it for a green card, too. I mean, like, and <laughs> when that ends, 
there's a whole village you can pull from. So that's my opinion. That's true. Yeah, I, 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 I'm down. So who did you? Okay, we're not going to go too much into it, but who did you get hooked up with? I was with Ash. He was from Australia. Um, so, I mean, luckily, I didn't have to go to a like a third world country where like the culture was very different and nothing against third world countries. It's just some of the storylines that I have seen. It's like a huge cultural difference. And when you're like filming for a whole month in an area where it's like completely different than anything that you are even used to, um, that would have terrified me. But I had, I had like, such an amazing experience in Australia. It was awesome. I mean, yeah. Ash was all right too. You got like. a good looking guy. <laughs> they hooked you up with a good looking guy. I mean, that at least worked for you. That's kind of cool. Well, he, they didn't hook me up. We were actually dating for nine months before. <laughs> oh, and then, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. So That's, like, they want to follow your love journey to like meeting for the first time, and then seeing if you guys are going to get married and. And if you get married, then you get to go on happily ever after, and then they follow your marriage. Oh, and then, and then when everything crumbles, they have a like a rehab show now for you to go to. Oh, I love therapy. It's, I, 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 it's so crazy it's to me because I'm so detached from television. But it's yeah. like when you get into television, it's just such a different vibe. But you've seen the yeah. no neck guy, right? The no yeah, neck I guy. love no neck guy. Yeah. That good was for my no season. Neck guy. Good, for, good. Good for no neck guy. <laughs> good for yeah, I know that was actually my season. Big oh, Ed stole the show. Oh, uh, no neck stole the show. I'm sorry. Well, you <laughs> no, it's got, okay. Yeah, Big, I, I mean, I, Big Ed just is like, I mean, now the guy is just known everywhere. He's on a meme everywhere. He's just like, he's freaking crazy. <laughs> I, I actually like Big Ed, but I also don't like Big Ed. Yeah, I get that. Crazy. I get that. I get that. So, uh, Chiller Queen, it's very, uh, first of all, before we get into it, you know, we've discussed this before. We have another podcast called Broken Sim. Somehow, some way, you had a crush on Johnny Woodard. N- n- when- why would you do Whoa. that to her? She did. She said no, she had why a crush. Would you, why would you blow up her spot like that? That's why? So because she's in a committed relationship, but you could be like back know, in the still, day. That's exactly why you don't break Sorry, it up. Sorry, Johnny. You <laughs> lost your chance. Oh, uh, it's over. I'm Shut not down, taking Johnny. it. I, wait, oh, that's I, why you didn't I'm want. in a relationship, too. That's what I'm saying. I mean, why would you? Uh, he doesn't want the tension. Johnny, it's okay to say yeah. somebody thought you were attractive and yeah, probably because okay. they had a drinking problem. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Okay. So like I said, I've been listening to this podcast for a long time. And I always enjoy Johnny's little like skeptical remarks. Yes, everybody in. seems to. Yes, everybody, everybody does not seem to. You can tell from my Twitter timeline. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, that's fine. I'm glad we can make a magic happen. So we're happy to be. We're happy you're on. We're, this is great. So uh, it's very interesting because uh, you know you want to talk about. What do you want to talk about? So. I really want to talk about this David Hamblin case uh, out of Provo, Utah. It's the ritualistic child abuse case. It's a heavy topic. It's it's a dark topic, but I'm try- I'm going to try not to like take it down those really dark avenues. But it's a case that not a lot of people are talking about, especially in the media. There's like if you look it up, there's not even very many videos on it. There's maybe a couple of local news reports that are out there talking about it. And I happened to stumble upon this case when I was researching into uh, some other stuff that kind of went in line with it. And when I when I got into it, it just like took me down this crazy rabbit hole. And I'm like, this is going down right now yeah, in I- Provo, Utah. You. Yeah. And so I, I don't think a lot of people have much information on it, but it stems from, you know, this this elusive LDS Church of Satan group that has been kind of disguising itself within the Mormon church. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about today is like what was included in the victim statements because they paint a very descriptive detail of this organization that allegedly a lot of people have been trying to take down for a long time. So... I uh I love I love that we're going to talk about this. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, we 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 touched on this a couple months ago, like a little bit. We didn't do a deep dive on, it, so I'm happy we're doing it right now. Uh, but when I hear what this guy does and his nickname, 
Like, I swear, I, I just want to get on a plane and go fuck this dude up. Like, <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Like, I, know, I am yeah. not even kidding. I like, know. if I ever got diagnosed as like, hey, your days are numbered, I promise you the first thing I do is fly to and, and fuck this guy up. Like I don't 100%. understand. I don't understand how anybody in this town doesn't make this guy's life absolutely miserable. It's like when I when I see Anthony Weiner, I will see him in New York, and I will let him know that I think he's a punk ass bitch, and if he wants to go outside, we can go fucking do it. I mean, and this 100%. guy, and, and this guy is like, like just right there with Anthony Weiner. Like, like, look at this guy is a piece of shit. Like, I forget what his nickname is, but when you think about when it's about what he does to children, the fact that this guy, anyone allows this dude to walk at all with any piece, any moment of his life is, 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 is just a sign that. That 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 the devil runs this realm. That's to me the s biggest sign that the devil runs this realm because this guy has any moment of peace. He shouldn't be allowed to sleep at night without thinking about people wanting to burn down his house. He shouldn't be able to leave the house wondering if today's the day he gets shot. Uh, uh, like this should be this guy's life for the rest of his life to the day he takes his last breath. His whole family should have to feel this pain. Uh, that's my opinion. So I I, I want to get I into it. Because this guy's a piece of shit, dude. There's like, you know, I know we have these 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 historical people that we 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 think of the worst of the worst, but this guy's right there. So where do you want to start? So I mean, okay, so there is so much details that I can't even cover the extensity of of this case within just this podcast. So uh, I'm going to first start off by just saying, you know, I'm not a journalist. I am not an expert on ritualistic child abuse or any of that kind of stuff. Listener discretion is advised listening to this because some of this stuff could be triggering. Um, but I'm just an independent researcher. And when I came across this case, it basically took me down like a wild rabbit hole of there was so much included in these victim reports of what happened to them and what occurred and you know the notable figure in this whole thing is David Hamblin because he's the one who's front and center in getting prosecuted right now uh, for this case but this case isn't just about David Hamblin this is like an entire huge spider web that extends far beyond David Hamblin mm -hmm. and that's what really intrigued me about this case but when I started going through and looking at all the victim statements what I'm going to be presenting to you guys is not me trying to convince you that there is this satanic organization that's operating out there or that I'm just trying to convince you of things that I'm just speculating on this is actually I'm going to be dissecting exactly what was oh included in these victim reports because I obtained through the Freedom of Information Act Damn. all of the pol police reports, the victim statements, the records, the videos, all of that stuff and began to read all of these statements. There's eight victim statements and what they paint in these statements is a very, very detailed picture um, of not just ritual abuse, but of this very organized satanic LDS Church of Satan that is operating within the LDS Church along with other religious sects um, that is basically using them as a guise for their organization to operate in. And so they, I mean, they have painted a picture of like their doctrines, their mythologies, their rituals, their ceremonies, um, and all the alleged members who are included in this, what they've done, what they've done to children. And I went through and I started analyzing all the statements that they were making. And I'm like, okay, well, if I'm going to believe these very sensational claims that these victims are stating, then I need to, you know, take some of the claims that they're stating and do a little bit more research on, you know, could this stuff be believable? And that's kind of what has led me into creating this bonus series that I'm doing for my listeners because I can't detail everything in this one podcast. But what I will say is right now, if you guys, if you're interested in this case after hearing it, if you guys want to learn more, you can, um, you know, I go into 
great detail. I have four episodes out right now, but and I have many more coming, but it really details all of the fine stuff that yeah. I have uncovered with my research for the last few months um, on this David Hamblin case. So it's, it's really crazy, you know, and so so we get, you know, obviously, like I, we were saying before the show, I, I go to Salt Lake. I'll, I'm going to be there next week. I'm looking at possibly doing some business. In Salt Lake, love Salt Lake. You know, as soon as I left college, I mean, as soon as I left high school, I moved from upstate New York to Las Vegas, and you know, and that's where I met Mormons. And the Mormons were really great. The Mormons mm -hmm. are really great. But like any structural group, I don't care what religion it is. You know, a lot of people want to get into the Catholics are always like this, but you see it through Judaism. You th see it through uh, Muslims. You see it through almost every single group. I mean, look at what, I mean, uh, Scientology. We look at like all the, the darkness within like any kind of formal structure of that involves religion ha when there is a power dynamic going on. There it tends to be positioning of people that have dark motives and are into dark arts. It happens every group. There's not one, one very few of these religions will you religions, not spirituality, and maybe even spirituality if you really did a deep dive into it. But more we're talking more organized groups that 100%. You, you see this happen because it's it, it and this gets into like this why I always say this is a war against God. We have, you know, it's like fallen angels versus God. And, and, and when you get into asking people, well, why are you atheist? Why are you all this? That they tend to want to be like, well, look what the church has done. And like, well, the church is not God. That is, this is being positioned. If you know that Hollywood is corrupt and you know that Washington, D.C. is corrupt, why wouldn't you corrupt? this power structure at every right. moment at every position why would well, you I, yeah I, I mean i would just take it and look at it this way you know where's the best place for for satan to to be in is to be in the church and destroy it right yep. it's like when you look at the institutional policies that a lot of these religious uh you know organizations have the policies and the the structure that they have, unfortunately, maybe in their eyes is, you know, great in God's way because they don't want to be judged by, you know, the secular community. But unfortunately, some of those policies that they have where, it, I mean, it protects abusers. It's like a, a haven for these types of organizations to breed and to... uh to produce and to protect abusers and not necessarily victims. And it's not necessarily the religion itself. There's a lot of really amazing people in there that are there for God and to learn about God and to get closer to God. But unfortunately, just like what you said, these, they're not, you know, they're not protected from the corruption and these predators and these people who, who come in and utilize them to commit these heinous things. I agree. And so, yeah. And and what I will tell you is the interesting part about this case, and we'll get into it too, when we, when we go into where the origins of this LDS Church of Satan came from, it will kind of shock you when it comes to the Mormon religion. Um, but, I mean, if you look at the, the LDS Church in and of itself, with all the claims that are coming out, especially now, um, where you have the Ruby Frank case. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but she just got arrested with Jody Hildebrandt in the same area where David Hamblin, you know, got taken down. They're part of the LDS church and they, uh, you know, just got arrested for child abuse. And Jesus. this is, and you look at the Boy Scouts is of America. Is that the YouTube we'll lady? That. Is that the YouTube lady? Yes, the Eight Passengers YouTube lady. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, I'll even say more about that too, but I'm going to give you guys like a, a I'm going to just start diving into this. Okay, David let's Hamblin go. Case. I'm let's give get you, into it. Okay. So, so David Hamblin, um, I was researching the Michael Aquino Temple of Satan. I was doing a series on Satanism, basically trying to understand what Satanists believe. And when I was doing a series on Michael Aquino with the Temple of Set, I found that, you know, there was a lot of conspiracies that surrounded around him with the Satanic Panic Era. 
And for those who don't know, the satanic panic era, you know, originated in the, you know, 80s and 90s. And it was chalked off as basically like this mass hysteria um, that Christians, you know, thought Satan was taking over the world and that they were there to, you know, make all of these crazy claims that there was this satanic cult that was ritualistically abusing children. And through that through that whole entire thing i mean these claims were th- in the thousands across the nation and a lot of the claims that the victims made were very similar to each other they had a lot of the same stories and these were spread all over the place even just in utah the place that we're going to be talking about you know and uh the michael aquino was tied to the presidio daycare case in san francisco yeah, California. real quick i just want to say something real quick it's real quick i want to tell you about our friends at fume that's right fume cold turkey may be great on a sandwich okay but there's a better way to break your bad habits we're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor or Xavier Guerrero, okay? What we're talking about is our sponsor, Fume, okay? And they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a dramatic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning device that does just that. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air and instead of harmful chemicals fume uses all natural delicious flavors you get it instead of bad fume is good it's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with a movable parts and magnets for fidgeting giving your fingers a lot to do which is helpful for de-stressing anxiety while breaking your habit, okay? Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup with destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today head to tryfume.com and use the code tinfoil to save 10 percent off when you get the journey pack today that's tryfum.com and use the code tinfoil to save 10 percent off your order today uh, so so if you go all the way back to mccarthyism right it is, it is of my belief that a lot of this stuff that happens, McCar- uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Red Scare, and then you get into sa- uh, uh, Satanic Panic, uh, to me, all of this is done a- as a way that when the stuff really starts to come back, come out, that everyone just goes, oh, well, oh, what is this, McCarthyism again? Oh, oh, mm-hmm. everybody's a Marxist, right? And then they also yeah. do it with like, oh, everybody, oh, yeah, Satan's everywhere. And you saw that with each of these. You know, when people started going, oh, that guy's a communist, people were like, oh, okay, what are you, McCarthy? And then when yes. all this satanic stuff started coming out, everyone started going, dude, it's just sa- it's a, a satanic panic again. And I go, no, it's not. Because those guys were right. They were all right. Yeah. You you may not like the way McCarthy handled it, and maybe he was set up to do that, but he was totally right. And he, yeah. so wasn't so was the satanic panic stuff, because when you actually, we have people on here all the time, that when we get into this daycare story, like, nobody told you they found tunnels underneath the daycare, right? Yeah. And nobody told you that. And I'm sorry, I, I love my friends who uh, have done interviews with the, the Memphis Three, but we've had enough people that have come on here and dropped real knowledge to say, those guys are guilty. And this was all a movement again by all your favorite Hollywood Satanists. And listen, we could love Johnny Depp because of how he got treated by Amber Heard, but Johnny Depp is a dark arts dude. And he was standing behind all those guys too. And if they you break it down, okay, again... This was a precursor to oh my god, just satanic panic again, and that's what they're exactly. doing. So you that's you, yeah, you're right. You mentioned it now. You sound like a crazy person. Yeah, like who does rituals? That's not real. Yeah, like, yeah, Super Bowl, yeah. Super Bowl. Well, they're doing that's, rituals. That's the whole thing with this is that 
the the claims are so sensational and because they have an element of like satan in them that it's it more brings like the religious aspect into it and it makes it hard for these cases to be prosecuted but what i'll say is that like when you dive into some of the like if you look at all the articles that were written during the satanic panic era and there were a lot of detailed articles and a lot of the media was reporting about some of the some of the things in this case but once they started getting chalked off and dismissed in the courts as like you know these that some of the the doctors were in on it, the therapists were in on it and all this other stuff and basically threw out all these claims. It was like the media did like a 180 and just started saying that, you know, this was all a mass satanic hysteria. And, you know, since then it's been like, it's, this is why I feel like they aren't really covering the David Hamblin case because it's like, they don't want to create another mass hysteria or, or even give any, type of credibility to to these victims or their cases and so when you look at some of the claims that were made during the satanic panic with these victims you can find so much evidence that points to yes these victims had at least been abused in some sort of way maybe not all of their claims are true but we can't necessarily say that they are or they aren't but there is actual evidence that some of this stuff did actually occur and so you know by this all getting just dismissed and discredited it kind of like left this open you know gap for all these conspiracies to come in and and start like being created around this whole thing you know a lot of people are out there trying to um provide evidence that this is happening and then you have the other side who's just like chalking it off as just you know satanic panic and they're not really in on this and so when I, you know, stumbled upon, when I was researching into this, you know, with the satanic panic era, I stumbled upon the David Hamley case and I don't even know how I stumbled upon it because it was just like one little article. And what intrigued me about his case was that he just got arrested last year, March of 2022, for accusations of ritualistic child abuse out of Provo, Utah that went back decades that started in the era of the satanic panic. And that's what got me like, oh, that's interesting because now we have somebody who's getting arrested for something that happened during the satanic panic era where there were claims being that were coming out in the same area that he was doing all of these things, but that was chalked off as a mass hysteria. And so now he's arrested and now we have all this stuff coming out. So then I started going into his case and basically... This is the the summary of of like the the David Hamlin case. So he in so in 2012 his daughters came out um basically they went to the police and they came out stating to them that they have been ritualistically abused for decades since the time that they were born from their father and not just their father they claimed that they were being ritualistically abused by their mother as well, who's Rosie Hamblin, Roselle Hamblin, as well as all members of their family, which means their paternal grandparents, their maternal wow. grandparents, <clears throat> their aunts, uncles, the wives of their aunts and uncles, oh, um, brothers or the the sisters and brothers of, you know, both the mother and the father. And that it didn't stop there. It extended to many other prominent figures within the LDS church and, you know, people who were very prominent figures in like uh, the the political and business establishment in Utah, just all these allegations, right? So they came forth in 2012 and um, basically had just such these sensational claims talking about how they were ritualistically murdering children. They were cannibalizing children. Um, they were part of all of these ceremonies, these rituals, and then gave a lot of detail on what was being done to them. And the police kind of looked at this and they're just like, okay, well, this happened a long time ago and we now need to find evidence that you're, you've actually been abused. Because not only are you claiming that David Hamblin 
is abusing you guys, but you're also claiming that there's murder involved, there's cannibalism, there's oh all these different, God. you know, things that can can be charged, you know, but they're trying to find evidence for this stuff. And so what they do is they, you know, David Hamblin was a psychologist um, in Provo, Utah. And what he was doing was he was, he he basically set up this therapy um he he didn't have a practice, but he set up therapy within his house and he would invite, you know, prominent people who were his patients and he would invite like um, victims of abuse and all these different types of things to his house as his patients. And um, what he would do is he would, it was basically like a front for a lot of the stuff that he was, he was doing, which was like prostituting his children out. And, uh, you know, he was using the patients would come in for for therapy sessions and he would allow them to abuse his children during these therapy sessions and then use the payments for that. It was basically like a money laundering thing where it was like they could make payments for therapy, but it was really payments for abusing his children and getting access to his children and yeah. stuff like that. So murder that when dude. he, yeah. So, so the children in the statement basically said that David Hamblin, um, he was an LDS member of the church. And on the outside, it looked like their family was part of the LDS Mormon religion. And what they said was that this was basically a guise to the fact that they were actually part of this elusive LDS Church of Satan, which actually goes back multi generations. And that there were a very, um, there was a lot of people who were part of this Church of Satan and that this was like a familial thing. So this was a multi-generational organization that was operating within the church. And so that's why you have the paternal grandparents, the maternal grandparents, all the people that were in there, as well as... Um, you know, a lot why a lot of these claims talk about how they were abused by not just some random person, but a lot of times it was the parents and it was the family that was involved in this because this is a multi generational thing. And so it's crazy, dude. Yeah. It's so basically, crazy. they're, yeah. So they were talking about how, um, you know, all these things were being done to them and the police were like, okay, well, we need evidence that this is happening because we don't, we can't get evidence that shows that you've been abused because it's been so long. Um, and these claims are so, you know, sensational. Why don't we wire you up and you can go to your mom and your dad and try and confront them and see if they will confess to these crimes. And this was in 2012, right? So they wire up one of the daughters. The daughter goes to David Hamblin and she says, basically, why did you rape me? And this is the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> this is the crazy part is that she goes to David Hamblin and this is what he says on tape. He says, I am so sorry for raping you. And he's like, he basically skates around it. He's like, I'm not saying that it's not true. I'm not saying that it didn't happen. But what I'm saying is that whatever or it wasn't me that did it it was what what was inside of my body basically it insinuating that there's this dark force or this dark entity that was that was doing these things to them that was operating with inside of him oh right oh my god yeah and so that was caught on tape and he confessed to it basically at that time, but he was blaming it on some dark force that was inhabiting his body. And so then the daughter goes to the mother, Rizelle, because all over in the victim statements, Rizelle is very much a part of this abuse, like very extensively. <clears throat> and so she goes to Rizelle and she says, you know, like, why'd you do this to us? Why'd you do this to me and my sister? And she is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I literally have no recollection, no memory of this. And then she says something really interesting. <clears throat> she says, the only thing I can think of is that David Hamblin, which they're, they're not, they weren't married at the time anymore. They were divorced. She said, David Hamblin was really good at programming and he must have programmed me to do those things. And that's why I don't remember. And 
that stuck out to me as well because so this is their the, mom or their stepmom this is their mom their mom saying that oh my god yeah so the mom's basically saying that she was programmed and doesn't remember abusing them and then david hamblin is saying that he did abuse them but it was some dark entity that was within him that did that so at that time and this is the crazy part so at that time the police still didn't prosecute they thought they thought they didn't have enough evidence at that time so they dismissed it without prejudice meaning they can collect more evidence and then reopen the case later so when these girls came forward there were some other victims that caught wind of them coming forward and they wanted to give credibility to these victim statements because the case had basically got dismissed. And so they came forth and there was one victim that came forth named Brett Bluth and Brett Bluth was a patient of David Hamblin's. He wasn't underage. He was, uh, he I think he was in his early twenties and he was part of the LDS church and he was struggling with homosexuality and so he went to his bishop and he basically told him, you know, like, I think I'm gay. I'm struggling with homosexuality. What do I do? And the bishop referred him to David Hamblin oh for therapy my. because allegedly David Hamblin was really good at he had this this uh, through a series of hypnosis. He had this therapy that he could reverse homosexuality within people. And, and so it had been proven before. So he, real quick, you know, I just want to say something. This is a sure. big reason why when I get into uh, I get into Christianity and all this stuff, and you know, is what like why I'm just never going to be part of this like demonize gay people because I have uh, friends that I'm pretty sure either killed themselves or drank themselves to death because they couldn't deal with the, the, the fact that they they were gay. And I just don't think I'm ever, I, I have zero desire to, um, uh, I have zero desire to, uh, be a part of that. And so I'm never going to be that. So that, so when I see a lot of these people on the right starting to like ease back, you know, starting to get right back into that demonizing all gay people and all that stuff. Like I have zero desire to participate in any of that. I have one rule. It's like, you don't hurt, per hurt people in particular children. And you'll never hear from me, uh, you know, and your, your connection with God is your connection with God. I will never be somebody who does that because I just think this is what happens. You have people mm -hmm. go through emotional and mental torture and they either drink themselves to death or off themselves because they just don't find their, their place in society. And I just think it's like, you know, and uh, personally, I don't think your sexuality should define who you are as a person. I just don't. Uh, I, I, you know, as much as I, I, I like as much as these people like they're de in the in the, who are part of the whole uh, queer theory uh, movement. I just don't think that should be who you are. I'd like to define you as a person. And I agree. So I don't want to. I don't want to demonize gay people, and I also don't want to uh, think that you should have to come out, and that should be everything about your life. You should just live your life, and whatever you do behind closed doors, as long as you're not hurting people, and you're doing it with consenting people, and you're not hurting people, and particularly children, you, you won't hear anything from me. I just want to get that out because I've seen this happen with pe where people just can't come to grips with who they are, and it just destroys them spiritually. I agree. But I also think too, even just in religion, there's just a lot of judgment in religion when religion, I mean, Jesus teaches that we should be non-judgmental, you know? So there's like, even if you didn't agree with the sexuality of somebody and they're a great person, like it's not even your business, yeah, you know, I like totally even, if, agree even if you don't agree, like with your own religious beliefs, like you you should never condemn somebody else because it's not even your job. You yeah. know, it's not your position. You aren't even called to judge people. And so I'm, I'm hundred percent on board with that where I have a lot of gay friends and I love them to death. And I think they're amazing people. And, you know, even if I didn't, have that particular like you know i i don't have a belief on it whatsoever necessarily but um just from a religious aspect it's like who am i to tell them that anything you know we're not supposed to yeah That's what i Jesus agree says. i think that you know there are some things that which is basically you have to accept jesus and god into your and that's it that if you're going to be a christian exactly. that seems to be 100%. that and you know so every, teach their own again and that's my opinion. Teach their own. 
As long yes. as you, you know you don't hurt people, and particularly ch- children. Go on. Sorry, I just want to get that out. <laughs> so. So with Brett Bluth, he he you know he was part of the LDS Church and he's struggling with his homosexuality. He gets referred to David Hamblin, and so he begins these sessions with David Hamblin. And he, David Hamblin basically tells him, "I'm going to be putting you through a series of hip, hip, hypnosis, basically, to kind of like rewire your brain and figure out where this homosexuality urge is stemming from." And so he's going through these through these like hypnosis uh he's trying to induce hypnosis on brett bluth and throughout the whole time brett bluth is very coherent he doesn't even feel like he's going into a hypnotic state at all he's very aware and eventually david hamblin comes out and tells him like oh through your hypnosis you uh revealed to me that you were sexually abused by the satanic cult and that's where all this this stuff is coming from. And Brett Blue's like, I don't remember that. Like, I've been coherently aware. I've been present this whole time. I, you know, I've never been abused. I don't, I don't even have any memory of that whatsoever. And he's like, oh, well, you know, let's just continue the therapy. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> let's just uh, dig out where this is coming from. And so throughout this process, he, he keeps putting him under these, you know, these hypnotic states or alleged hypnotic states. I thought he was going to do the thing where your parents catch you uh, smoking cigarettes. They make you smoke a million cigarettes. <laughs> He's going to be like, blow me a thousand times. And, oh. we'll fu- and, and then, no, that was uncomfortable. Oh, just wait. Oh, just wait, oh, Sam. Oh, okay. Oh. I made a joke and then it becomes real. <laughs> oh, no. oh, go on. Sorry. And so, so he's sitting there through. So, so one day, uh, Brett Bluth wakes up and he looks down and he has this symbol carved in his arm and he wonders where it came from. Right. What? And he goes to David Hamblin and he, he shows him the symbol and he's like, I don't know why I carved this symbol into my arm. And David Hamblin's like, Oh, that's interesting because I have another, I have another patient who is suffering from satanic ritual abuse. And just the other day, she showed me this symbol and it's in my notebook. And that he pulls up his notebook and he shows it to Brett Bluth. And Brett Bluth sees that and he's like, oh my gosh, maybe I am part of this satanic ritual abuse, you know? And and now I'm starting to trust what David Hamblin's telling me because... I didn't even know about that symbol and now I'm carving it in my arm, you know, and now it's he, like Brett Blue's kind of like now taking, yeah, credibility. But what, what actually happened was that through the hypnotic state, David Hamblin had actually exposed this symbol to Brett Blue through the hypnotic state. And that basically was like imprinted into his mind. And when Brett Bluth went through a very depressive period, he had carved it onto his arm and had so shown weird. it to him. Yeah. So it, it's like these mental manipulation techniques that he was using wow. to basically get into his head and make him believe that he was being ritualistically abused so that he could come up with the therapy. Right. And so. <clears throat> he starts to trust David Hamblin that <clears throat> maybe he is like part of this abuse. So David Hamblin basically tells him that you were ritualistically abused by men and that's why you have these homosexual tendencies. And the only way to, <laughs> to get rid of this is to take in the, you know, semen of a righteous man. And then, Okay. He gives himself, he, he <laughs> volunteers himself to be the righteous oh, man. What a gentleman. Oh, my. Yes. What a gentleman. I mean, but, I, I mean do, do you know any righteous men? I mean, like, I don't have anybody around. I, mean, I guess I'm, I'm pretty good. I, you know, I, oh, man, oh. dude. <laughs> if nobody else will do it. What guys do to get laid? It's unbelievable. Well, I love it. He's like, yeah. I, dude, I wasn't hypnotized at all. He's like, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Let's see about that. But the, back to that real quick, then we'll get into the creepiness thing. But have you ever been dr- left the television on and been dreaming? Oh, yeah, and it and gets in there. it yeah. gets in. That's yeah. that. That's why I buy into that. Like, if you yeah. can get somebody hip- hypnotized, you can put thoughts in their head. Yeah, yeah, but you got to give yes, them. you can plant that's false some- memories. Yeah. You can do all that stuff. And that's a huge, huge aspect of how these people operate. That's why I'm bringing this up. Because uh, this is 
how, I mean, when you put somebody into a hypnotic state, you can mentally plant things into their head that linger with them, you know? And so he was using these psychological techniques to manipulate people into allowing him to them to be abused by him. And so he was doing this with multiple patients. It wasn't just Brett Bluth, but Brett Bluth basically, uh, you know, he allows this the abuse to happen. So he he goes through the abuse with David Hamblin and it's afterwards so he crazy. Feels, it's so yeah. crazy. Did he go, okay, explain to me how that works. Like explain <laughs> to me if I I I I blow you, how does that cure me? Do you ask well, I, that well, question? I, I, I've got the magic jizz inside okay. of me, and I mean, then you'll have like it inside it, of you. I just like does anyone go? Well, why why does that work? Like, what is well, it, what is but, happening? Well, I would have been like, do I have options? Yeah, Can I, I blow I, some I, other I, dude. I I like, why is it only a you? Yeah. Here. I have to say though, if you're already believing that magic underwear are protecting you, you know, it's not that great of a leap. To yeah. magic jizz. I get that, but dude, I mean, at some, especially if you kind of are battling that you might like that. I get that, but it's there. You go, yeah. but just yeah, you're walk, right. You're right. You're totally walk right. me through it. How that? Well, what's gonna happen? I, I just, it's, it's crazy. I, to I got me. a question. Is this guy talented? Yeah. Is that a skill? Are these people gullible? Where are we putting? Is, is he a demon? Is he like a demon? Because no, I'm all... sure he's charismatic. That's how no, they do he, it. No? He is. But he was very, very good at like different types of of psychological techniques to groom and plant like beliefs into people's heads. And so this is so with Brett Bluth, what what you guys are missing is, you know, a lot of detail on this of how he groomed him, because this was over a very long period of time before he actually got to the abuse. And he basically mentally broke Brett down to the point where he was like mentally broken, thinking that he was actually being ritualistically abused by all these Satanists and that he had experienced all these things. And he goes into the severe depression, never had really any issues before that, just homosexuality. And now all of a sudden he is like in a very dark place and all he wants is to be better. And this therapist who has convinced him that you know he can trust him is now saying like you know you now have to have sex with a righteous man it's so in, in, in weird in order to like cure this and so the so right after the abuse happens brett is like disgusted and he's like this is not right. This did not work. This did not help me. <laughs> By the way, I'm not gay. I just found out. I just found out I'm not gay. So it worked. I mean, yeah. that's, I why mean the guy, that's why way. he keeps sending people yeah. to him because yeah. it works. It works In every a weird time. way, it did work. <laughs> well, well, ironically, Brett is still uh, gay, but he had this feeling afterwards that was like, dude, this is wrong. That was so wrong. You know, this didn't work, blah, blah, blah. So then he goes to to david hamblin and he tells him he says if you don't report this to doppel which is the people who license him then i'm gonna go there and i'm going to report the fact that you're having sex with your patients and so david hamblin himself calls doppel and not only confesses to having sex with brett he confesses to having sex with multiple patients and then doppel takes his license away so then David Hamblin now decides, okay, I'm going to become a medicine man. I'm going to become a shaman and I'm joining the Native American church. And now I'm going to conduct my therapy sessions through healing ceremonies where I can administer peyote, which is a psychedelic drug, to the people and then help them heal their traumas that way. Okay. And so he starts becoming this you know, Native American medicine man. And he oh joins my. the Native American church run by James Mooney, which in the victim statements, James Mooney is also claimed as being part of this LDS church of Satan um, who have abused these victims. So he joins the Native American church and in another victim statement that came forth, this girl, and I'm telling you these two stories because it's going to become really important later, but this girl who's who wasn't part of the family she was somebody else she was part of the lds religion she was looking for some sort of healing 
And it was it was kind of controversial at that time, but they were open to having like healing ceremonies and like energy healing work and things like that in the LDS church. And so she gets referred to these healing ceremonies with David Hamblin and she shows up to the ceremony and they start giving everybody this peyote. And apparently this is a group of people who, who are either trying to heal from trauma or they've been abused in some way. And he's there to kind of guide them through their abuse and help them. And so she's there and she takes the peyote, but she, she starts to kind of hallucinate, but it's not, she's not at a certain level like the other people. So she's very coherent and she remembers everything that happened there. And she says, once everything started getting started and, uh, you know, everyone started beginning to hallucinate, they change into these different colored robes. And she said that the, the aura of the, the ceremony started to change and feel really dark. And she said that David Hamlin came to her and started trying to tell her that she had been ritualistically abused by the satanic organization. And she's like, and she's like, no, I wasn't. And he goes, yeah, it was your father. It was your father who abused you. He's part of this satanic, this satanic group. And uh, that's where all this trauma is coming from. And he starts telling other people there in the ceremony as well. And the other people in the ceremony is like believing it. You know, they're playing into this. And she's like, no, I've never been harmed by my father. Like, and he he basically starts beating it into her head that she is she has been ritualistically abused uh, by the sat- satanic group and then makes her confess to the whole group that she had been sodomized and that she had experienced all these things at the hands of her Jeez. father. And so she had to get up and admit it to everybody. And she says at that point, she feels this dark force like come up her leg and into her groin area. And she like looks up at David Hamblin and sees like his face just looks super dark. And she said that the whole energy of the ceremony changed after that. And she's like, this isn't healing. This isn't, she's like, this is more of like some sort of satanic ritual. She's like, I just felt very weird and I felt like I needed to get out of there. And so she leaves and she says that this dark force followed her home and she could feel a lot of like there were weird things that were happening. She had to go to her bishop and get a cleanse and all this other stuff in order for it to go away. And so I bring up these two cases because when we're talking about the elements of like a lot of these people talk about how they were ritualistically abused in, in, you know, by satanic groups and all this other stuff. And they're very detailed about what has happened there's a huge element of programming and mind control that runs throughout all of these victims' statements. And those two people were the ones who were basically talking about how they were being forced to try and believe that they were part of some satanic organization or cult that they were being abused from. And I guess they actually maybe were, but maybe not to the extent of what some Such of the other victims have play. said. It's such a weird yeah. play, right? Because you're fully into it. And then yeah. now you're telling people that they got done to them in the past. I wonder what the play is on that. Oh, I, I 100% believe that it is to avoid prosecution. Because, and this is why I think that this is uh-huh. so, so important to their practice. Because when you look at a lot of these MK Ultra victims who say that they were like programmed to be sex slaves and they were programmed to do all these different things, and they have very detailed uh, memory of, you know, people being ritualistically abused, children being murdered, uh, you know, all these crazy sensationalized things that I believe have elements of truth mixed with elements of falsity that were planted there in order to evade prosecution because let's just say a victim goes to the police and they say Mm. i have been abused by my father by the way it's also part of this organized satanic group that also murders children they also cannibalize children i've been a part of all of these things and now the police goes okay you're making all these claims I can find evidence you've been abused, but I can find absolutely zero evidence that anyone's been murdered. I can't find evidence of this 
organization. I can't find evidence of, you know, maybe they can find evidence, but not like, right. I can't find bones. I can't find, you know, all these things. And then that gets chalked off to now being not credible. So what elements of their statement can they use as being credible evidence? Because if half of their statement can't have verifiable evidence or it's false, then why believe the other half? And it's like, oh. you can't just charge half and then ignore the rest. And, and so it's like a very, uh, it, it's like a very strategic move that you can find throughout all of these claims no, you're is that there's like this element of like a lot of these people are therapists. It's just like the jo Jody or the Jody Hildebrandt. She was a therapist and she did exactly like the victims that are coming forth with the Jody Hildebrandt case with the eight passengers. Um, a lot of them are claiming that they're, I mean, Jody Hildebrandt used the exact same tactics that David Hamblin did and got in their families and did all this stuff. And and by the way, all of the claims in that situation, like with the Ruby Frank, they talk about how this is a multi-generational abuse in her case. And so you have all of a sudden so many of these claims talking about how this is a multi-generational organization that is that is passed down from child to child. So the abused becomes the abuser and that all of this is for this doctrine, which is the this LDS Church of Satan. And so they, you know, not only in these statements, and when you read them, it is easy to be like, okay, this just seems so bizarre and so like crazy that I don't know if I can believe this stuff. But then you kind of sit back and look at it from the other way and you go, wait, this is so detailed. This is so intricate and has like it has the mythology the doctrine the the ceremonies like it has so many things that are laid out that you go well how can they just lie about that you know what you're you know you're this is so interesting because you know when the me too movement started coming out there was a part of the truth community it was like they're laying this down and they're laying it so thick that when it comes out that a lot of this has no evidence, right? That people are going to now push back on any accusation. So when the really dark stuff starts to come out, everyone's going to be like, oh, no, that's no, that's real. So now what do we have is we have Russell Brand coming out and what's everybody doing? Not, not real. That didn't happen. Yep. Uh, push back on it and everything like that. And so not that I, I mean, I don't think Russell Brand is an abuser. I do think he had a giant sex addiction like a lot of these guys. And that again, we've set this thing where it's re weaponized regret, right? But. Mm -hmm. You are looking at everyone going, didn't happen, didn't happen. We got to push back. We can't let this. And it's like, okay, if I'm the masters of mankind and I'm watching this because, hey, everybody, this involves the masters of mankind. All of these legacy media people on one side. And then what's new? Rumble. And look who is involved with Rumble. It is masters of mankind. The people behind Rumble are masters of mankind. So what do we always talk about? How we we wash them. They set a precedence. They 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 establish one brand, and when they want to introduce another brand that maybe they have more control over, they 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 basically uh, control demolition. The other one, great example, MySpace, Facebook, right? And now what we're kind of seeing with that, in my ob opinion, is. Pornhub only fans, right? They're imploding P Pornhub, and now they're every they're moving everybody to only fans, and now only fans is a little crazier because now it involves everyday people becoming porn stars and all the negative energy to that. Well, it's now, more interesting, yeah, because Pornhub's boring now, right? Yeah, Pornhub's kind of boring now. Like, it's ah. like oh, now now instead of being like these kind of outlaws who do this because of whatever happened in their life, this is the one way they f they find they can function to make money. Now you're getting everybody who just doesn't want to have a day job to do this narcissist shit. Let's see how and, far they'll go. Yeah, and and now that's on them. And so now let's take a look at what's going. YouTube, all this crazy stuff's happening on YouTube. Look who's going to be white knighting it now. Rumble. Rumble. 
But and now we now if I'm a master of mankind, I go, yeah, they're not believing anybody now with Russell Brand. Let's now it's time to start easing out this other stuff because everyone's gonna push back on it. Yes. Something to think about. I mean, everybody plays off of their own biases. And that's why even with this Russell Brand thing and even with the I'm sorry to say this, but Tim Ballard from, you know, the Sound of Freedom and and you know, I've looked a lot into him as well. I have stayed quiet on all of that because I am not going to be on board for just completely, uh, you know, like I'm I'm an advocate for victims because I am one. And so I don't automatically just come out before any type of evidence or anything is out there to just say and discredit a victim, you know. And so I always wait and see uh, but it's it's blown my mind just even with like the recent allegations coming out that people are so quick to discredit a victim's statement just because of they like the politics of the person or they like what the person's saying or they, you know, believe that it's part of some conspiracy to get them, you know, shut down or whatever. Um, so I, I'm I'm like one of those people. I I'm I'm not gonna completely discredit the victim before I even have like any of the evidence or any of that kind of stuff, which is why I'm just been diving into this case so much. I'm not going to be like, just because it goes against what I believe. Right. So that fits in. Exactly I'm going to just what discredit it. That fits in exactly what you're saying is that, is that if you establish that all these people bring up satanic ritual abuse, with no evidence, the cops will eventually dismiss it all as here we go again. I mean, they yeah. kind of, I, I mean, I don't know what private school was or I don't know what school it was, but I was watching a documentary where they kind of did the same thing with the kids, where the kids got touched, but then the kids were saying some crazy shit where like, where you're like, is either I'm going to believe you, you're making shit up, where yeah. you're looking at it like either you believe that you got touched or there was clowns on the wall hanging and it was so. Where you like it's it was that thing no, where either you believe totally the kids right. or you don't. Yep. It's so crazy. 100%. Where, yeah, because yeah, you just are so quick to discredit everything else that they're saying when all of a sudden they start saying these, you know, very sensationalized things. But I think that is very strategically done yeah, by the abusers because like uh, let me take for instance, I listened to your guys's uh episode where you had somebody who was a expert therapist who who uh this, you know this, gave therapy yeah. to ritual abuse victims right yeah. and you guys were trying to figure out like is this is there evidence is there true right and one thing that really stood out to me of what he said was that you know he had a patient who thought that she had given birth to multiple children and that the birthing was just basically to to make babies for this this group of you know ritual abusers to you know either sacrifice the kids or or whatever it is and that when it came down to it and she got checked by the doctor, it actually turned out that she was a virgin. So there was evidence to show that no, she had never had these children, but in her mind, she fully 100% believed that she had given birth to multiple children that were being used in, you know, ritualistic ways. And so I think through the process of how they abuse these people, and it's so easy to do with children because children can be coached. You can implant things easily into their brain and without even knowing it. You know, you can talk to a child and if you're not educated on how to get information from a child, you can actually just plant the information into 100%. the child's mind and then the child will start saying it. Right. So if we're, you know, and that's why I think there's just so much muddy in the water when it comes <clears throat> when it comes to this satanic panic era is that, yes, I do think that there are some elements of of people putting things into the kids' heads and them running with it. But also there's evidence that these children were abused. You don't have children getting cl chlamydia and have never been sexually abused, you know, and there were children who were reported to have STDs. How do you get STDs as a three-year-old? Oh. You know, it's like it, there's obvious abuse going on, but now you have to sift through this illusion that they have created to get down to the meat of it. Right. And so it's easier just to dismiss it than to prosecute it. And I think that's a huge element of this. And so with this LDS Church of Satan, these girls 
when you when you look at it like they have painted such a such a detailed picture of this organization they talk about the mythology they talk about the bloodline so with this lds church of satan it's important for purity of their bloodlines and so this that's why it's a familial thing that's why it's an incestuous thing because they believe that the more pure that your bloodline is the greater power and status you have with satan and the greater power and status that you will have when he comes back and conquers Jehovah God. Hold on, hold um, on. Let me ask you something real quick. You keep referring it to the LDS Satan, which is, I know it as the Church of Latter-day Saints. But you're yes. trying to say that this organization literally worships Satan? Like it So, no. So, okay, let me let me kind of... I'm going to, so again, and I just want to say that, you know, I love Mormons. This is not a, a thing against Mormons. This is against this particular group. So I want people to understand that, that you know, and within any group, the, it's my bit about how everybody's ret <laughs> retarded. Like within every group, there are idiots and scumbags. And yes. what we get into in this moment where we, we defend the entire group, we defend individuals by defending the entire group instead of going, well, the whole group isn't like that. It's this one scumbag, and I hate the scumbag too. And that's every group. You see it done on a very large scale right now with, with Judaism, stuff like that. Instead of like calling out individuals, you have people dis defending the entire group. And it, for me, it's like... White people should be the standard in which how we treat all groups, which is everybody. Go, white people are the only ones who have to go. It's not us. It's this one group. Of, this person's an idiot. Every other group defends the entire group. And it's like an assault on one is an assault on every. No, it's a it's an assault on one is an assault on one. And the rest of the group should be like, dude, we're not that guy. Feel free to light him the fuck up. Okay, like that's my opinion. So I just wanted to get and say that real quick so everyone understands no. where we're from. Yeah, that's good. I just want to make sure I clarify on that because I don't want to be painting this picture that I'm talking about Mormons. Okay, yes, right. So. So with the LDS Church of Satan, not to be confused with Anton LaVey's Church of Satan, okay, because that's a completely different sect. Anton LaVey did not believe in Satan himself. Um, the Church of Satan, when we talk about the Church of Satan, even just in Anton LaVey, a lot of his philosophy was just an inverse to the Christian theology. Yeah, okay, he's so, just a like, fucking dork. He's just yeah. a Dungeons and Dragons dork trying to bang yes. fat goth chicks. That's all that that's all these people are. They're just nerd Dungeons and Dragons nerd dorks trying to act cool for fat goth chicks. Yeah, that's my trolls. humble opinion. They're yeah. Trolls. Well, a lot of these, you know, churches of Satan, which there's various different sects. We're not just talking and clumping them all into one one belief. Um, but all of these sects are usually an inverse to whatever, you know the the opposite is right so when we're talking about the lds church of satan what we're talking about is an inverse to the lds doctrine so there is the mormons and then there are the lds church of satan it's just like if you had christians versus the church of satan so lds church of satan is actually just the inverse belief of what the lds belief is and when we get into the origins of where this this uh, alleged group has allegedly originated from, then it will make a little bit more sense okay, to you on where this split in the Mormon church. Okay. So, yeah. So, okay. So with this LDS church of Satan, they're very particular on their bloodlines. This is a familial thing. They're very much about uh, purity of the bloodlines. And so it, that's why you have like, the importance of understanding the mythology and the and the LDS history and where everything came from, the reason why a lot of people can look at these claims and go, they're so sensational, I can't believe it. When you have, I mean, how do you have the mother, the grandparents, the brother, the sister all involved in this? Like, that, that's just crazy. I could never get my whole family involved in this, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? So people look at that and they go, that's just crazy. But until you look at the historical doctrines of the LDS church and you look at uh, the belief system within the LDS church, I'm talking about Mormon, it's not the church of Satan. Um, you can kind of give uh, 
it's more not it's it's not implausible to believe what these people are saying because with the LDS Church of Satan they're very much about like uh you know incest polygamy um keeping the bloodlines pure so they inbreed a lot and you know they can only marry other Church of Satan members um they have a high council so there's multiple groups and for each group there's a high council and they actually operate their ordinance is within the Manti uh Utah temple according to the victim statements everything i'm saying is according to the victim statements plus some of the research that i've done on the side um but they have i mean they you can trace their bloodline back to the beginning of the LDS church. So I'm going to tell you guys um, a little bit of a story. So you guys kind of understand how the Mormon church kind of came about and where this whole, cons- there's a conspiracy that's going on within the Mormon church, which actually revolves around polygamy. but that's where this whole thing kind of originated. And this comes from the victim statements. Um, so, I mean, do you guys know the history of the LDS church? No, I'd like, love to hear it. Joseph Smith? I would love okay. to hear it. Yeah, so, okay. So, with Joseph Smith, basically, like, in 18... He, he was born in the 1800s, and, and Joseph Smith goes out into the woods. He's, like, in his 20s or whatever. He goes out into the woods, and he gets this vi- vision. He gets his first vision. And it's of God the Father and God the Son. They come to him... um, basically in the woods and he you know at the time they were really religious so joseph smith asked god the father and god the son you know what's the right denomination and god the father tells him that they're all an abomination that you know all of them are bad so joseph smith basically goes back to his mom tells him or tells her that you know all the religions are bad and she basically brushes him off right and so um so later, he there's this uh, uh, Maroni, this angel that comes to his bedside and basically tells him that there's these gold tablets and that on the gold tablets, there's these two stones and that, uh, you know, you can use the stones to tran or you can use the stones that are on the gold tablets to translate the scripture within the gold tablets. And this basically gets eventually translated into the book of Mormon, Um, but basically tells him where these gold tablets are. And so Joseph Smith goes off and he finds these gold tablets and he comes back and he's like, I have these gold tablets and tells his family, his family's like, Oh my gosh, you're, you're right. You're true. You know, there is this other religion, whatever. And, tells the church and the church basically like scrutinizes his family and, um, and basically, you know, they go under a lot of scrutiny. And so Joseph Smith and his wife, Emma head off to Pennsylvania to like kind of escape the scrutiny. Um, And then, so basically, uh, you know, after they moved there, they had the gold tablets and the third cousin of Joseph Smith's mother um, was named Oliver Crowdery. And he basically, in 1829, he sets off to visit Smith when he learned that he had obtained these tablets, which basically led him to becoming Joseph Smith's scribe and translating the gold tablets, um, basically into what is known as the Book of Mormon right now. So Damn. in 1830, the Church of Christ, that was the original church, was formed by six men at the home of Peter Whitmore. And Peter Whitmore had this son-in-law and his name was Haram Page, who allegedly was one of eight witnesses who personally saw and got to handle these gold tablets. So a few months later, after this whole thing had started, Joseph Smith shows up to Whitmore's house and basically sees Haram, the the son-in-law, he sees him with a black seer stone producing his own revelations and prophecy, prophecies. And Peter Whitmore and Oliver Crowdery was like, 
testifying that to the authenticity of these revelations. He like tells Joseph Smith, no, we saw these revelations, these prophecies that were coming from this black seer and we're authenticating them. Dude, what a weird time, huh? I mean, just weird, bro. You're like, what's going to happen today, dude? (laughs) What (laughs) angel's showing up today? What weird stone is somebody pulling out their ass? Like, what is going on? Imagine that. You're like hanging out in a cabin in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of lying. Dude, I got this vision. There's going to (laughs) be robots. And it's just like. Makes your life feel pretty ordinary. it's a doctrine, dude. Crazy, bro. That's just crazy. This whole story is freaking. It's it's nuts. Um, And so Joseph Smith's like, I don't know who you're talking to, um, but I'm the only one getting the like the revelations from god so whatever you guys are are getting is actually from the devil and so it was believed that these the black seer stone and these revelations that haram made Whoa. with it were destroyed okay but apostle alvin dyer claimed that he had discovered the seer stone in 1955 because the whitmer family had secretly held on to it and passed it down through the generations. Now, Smith, a uh, Joseph Smith, he argued with them that, like, no, I am the only prophet, okay? So, whatever you guys are are prophesying is actually not from God. Only what I say is coming from God. So, whatever you guys are saying is is more just, like, wisdom, wisdom for the church. And so, Joseph Smith basically won out on that, and they had to basically conform to what Joseph Smith was saying. Um, now there's a lot of controversy around what I'm about to get into, but basically in 1838, allegedly Crowdery went to Joseph Smith and found out that Joseph Smith was having an affair allegedly with his maid. And, um, and at the time Joseph or Crowdery was like, I'm totally against like adultery. There's not supposed to be adultery in this, you know, religion. And I'm against polygamy and plural marriages. And so he allegedly started this rumor that Joseph Smith was, you know, having an affair with a maid, which basically began. And we're still in like the beginning stages of this LDS religion. And that basically began this, uh, this, the beginning of this polygamy doctrine that happened within the LDS church, because it was stated that Joseph Smith was having multiple wives at this time. And that he was also having concubines, which means, you know, mistresses. Okay. And so that made it to where they thought that that was coming from God. Like that was God's word that you could have, multiple wives and you were just bringing more children to God and that you were just, you know, every time you married someone, you were just sealing yourself to that person, which would then end up going to the celestial kingdom with you and you would be sealed to your family for eternity. So, the more that you could have, the more children, the more wives you could have, basically, you know, you were bringing more children to God. And so, they took on, you know, them believing that Joseph Smith was having multiple wives and that also he was he had a mistress they started teaching that plural marriage was okay and that polygamy was okay now granted everything that i'm saying right now there's a lot of this is the big conspiracy going on within the mormon religion okay this whole situation right here um yeah and so so basically uh joseph smith then in you know right before joseph smith died a year before there was all this controversy between Joseph Smith and the leaders of the church and polygamy because all the historical leaders were teaching that pl- that polygamy was okay. And Joseph Smith, you know, them all thinking that he was, you know, cheating on his wife and having all these wives, um, he, he basically started condemning polygamy and he goes after these leaders who are teaching polygamy and excommunicating them. And these leaders are getting really mad that he was doing that. Yeah, I could see and, that. <laughs> yeah. And so the historical doctrine. So this is where it gets kind of crazy because after he died, um, he, it was written. So like in 1843, right before he died, 
He wrote July 12th, 1843. This was his revelation from God about polygamy. So granted, before that, they were teaching the church that they that polygamy was okay and that Joseph Smith had all these wives and blah, blah, blah. Well, it wasn't until 1843 that Joseph Smith actually got his revelation from God about polygamy. And he wrote in his actual journal because he kept a journal and this is documented like there's picture evidence of this he wrote in july 12th 1843 that he was against polygamy and that only one man should have one wife in this life and that that's basically god's word well after he died so he he had the scribe at the time his name was william clayton and william clayton was the one who was basically writing for him. He was writing in his his journal and all that kind of stuff. He was, you know, whatever revelation that he was coming, he was writing it down. So William Clayton, right after he died, decides to go and uh doctor the what he had said inside of his journal and replace it with that it basically plural marriages and polygamy was okay. And that that was what the doctrine that was coming from God. So he basically changed and there's, there's actually picture evidence of this manipulation happening in his journal. So William Clayton, the scribe goes in an affidavit and what, he just states, erase it. Like there was no, like there's no, no email. he adds to it. You can actually see where he adds to the sides of the paper. Oh my, Oh man. Yeah, uh, this is so a you holy can actually, script, and just this little <laughs> scribbling over here—that's important too. Like, dude, crazy, crazy. Yeah. So, but they missed in October of 1843. Joseph Smith makes another statement within his own journal about condemning polygamy, and that one was later doctored to make everything more cohesive with the historical doctrine of the church. So in the church right now, in the historical doctrine, in, in um, Doctrines and Covenants 132, it actually talks about how it came from God that this that plural ma- marriage and polygamy is okay. Well, that was not what Joseph Smith said originally. So when he died, William Clayton... Um, came in as the, you know, the scribe and he wrote in an affidavit, you know, that I witnessed Joseph Smith had multiple wives. I uh, witnessed that, you know, he has multiple children and all this stuff and that he was for polygamy. And so that contradicted what the journal said and all these LDS leaders that now were fighting for polygamy to be true had now taken over the church and had basically uh, changed and manipulated what Joseph Smith said into this new doctrine of polygamy and plural marriages, which is where all this incestuous relationships, these polygamous sects come from. This is where all these people have basically like split because, you know, later you have this, you have this dichotomy where it's like you have the, the mainline Mormons who are like, no, there's, we're supposed to have plural marriage. And then you have these sex that come off of it, which are like the polygamy sex who are basically trying to restore the historical doctrine of the church and restore it back to its original teaching, which is why you have all these like, you know, like Warren Jeffs and all that kind of stuff. And so basically what happened was, is um, so the victim's statement specifically says, so this is the interesting part. So, Crowdery, who started the whole the whole ri- uh, rumor about the polygamy thing, um, he had actually gotten excommunicated after he had gotten into an issue with Joseph Smith about all of that stuff. And so he got excommunicated. But after Joseph Smith died, Crowdery decides he's going to come back to the church, which is now under this new um, this, you know, new leadership that is all for polygamy and also changing the doctrine of Joseph Smith to be more in line with what they created. And ironically, at the time before that, Crowdery was against polygamy. So he's coming back into a situation where it's all for polygamy. He's also started studying law and doing all this kind of stuff. Well, the reason why I'm telling you this whole story was because 
in the victim's statements, Crowder is named as the elect member of the LDS Church of Satan. Oh, man. And so their family, so the victim's statements, the Hamblin family, she claims that their family is part of a group within the LDS that aligned with the historical doctrine and wanted to continue in order to carry out its mission. And that the Church of Satan basically taught that its origins traced all the way back to Oliver Crowdery, the second member of the church. Oh, a man the second had, guy? He was man, the second. you can't yeah. even get going. The second dude's already <laughs> pulling some shit. Yes. Damn. And so you had Joseph Smith and Oliver Crowdery, who were the first two baptized into this LDS church. He was the one who started the rumor that Joseph Smith had multiple wives and that he was was having an affair. And like Joseph's, the, the whole doctrine right now that Mormons actually operate on, which a lot of Mormons are told not even to read uh, doc, uh, Doctrine and Cover- Covenants 132, they even choose to like skip over it because there's so much controversy within the church about the beliefs on polygamy and where it stems from. And it's even there like this has gone so deep and this is why i say like this has started from the beginning according to them um that right when joseph smith died it was almost like this organization completely took over and now it traces back into all of the policies that are set up within the lds church you have um you know i just i just saw not that long ago that the church had even come out and and uh, admitted that Joseph Smith had all of like at least 40 wives. And so now, do that, you think that's he really did this- have that? Do you think he really had 40 wives? Or do you think he really was true to his beliefs? So that's where it gets really um, sketchy. No, we're past I- sketchy. That exit left a long time ago. So I mean, we're 40 we're- and 40. 40 is so That's every, just a lot. Like that's just three, too much. four, I believe three, four, that's maybe just 10. too much. What's the black comic saying that has like 10 kids right now? And we think that's crazy. Imagine having 40 wives. It's too much. It's so funny. That's like, it'd be, it'd be like if XG, you know, after you died, he, he started changing your legacy. You yeah. Know, just like, <laughs> Which I wouldn't doubt. He's wearing a scarf right now. Yeah, so I start telling people. Hey. So here's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is the crazy part. Okay. Because I started, I'm like, if, if he had, if they admitted through historical record that Joseph Smith had sealed himself to all of these wives, right. Then obviously he must have proof by having all these children that are out there. Right. So if you're if you're having all these Good children, point. then then genealogically you should be able to trace that there's multiple the children state, yeah. outside of, of his wife to Joseph Smith, right? So this is this is the funny part. So they can't find any evidence because they have traced all of the descendants of Joseph Smith and they've looked at the genealogy and all of it traces back to his one wife, Emma. Okay. There's no other children that have been traced to Joseph Smith, but yet he's had 40 wives. And you know what they say? You, so since they've never found any evidence that this is true, but they all, all claim that it's true. What they state is that, well, he didn't look at it as a sexual relationship with these women. It wasn't about sex. It was about bringing more people to God. And sealing, just just by him sealing himself to these women, it ensured these women were going to go to the celestial kingdom and be with God and be with him. And it was just basically like doing them a favor. Yeah. So or, that was. Or he's got a pull out game strong, dog. Pull out <laughs> game strong. <laughs> Look, nobody's is that strong. Yeah. Nobody can, nobody can no. take 40 shots and no, not no. take some death. Yeah. That's the list. That's the list of his wives. When he met him, oh, when he like married his name. Wow, Zena oh, Huntington, geez. yeah, twelve Agnes. years old. No, but then he also met a four, a fifty-eight, and then married her at fifty-eight. Well, this one, her, her name is Cool Birth. That's a cool name, <laughs> Agnes. Her name Coolbirth. is Cool Birth. Agnes Cool Birth. <laughs> what, what, well, best, that makes sense. That's the best I mean, name like I've they need men life. after their jobs. Like, hey, you know, oh, Tom cool Blacksmith. Brith. I'm sorry, it's Cool Birth. Cool Birth. Oh, okay, Lucinda Pendleton. <laughs> that's a good one, Lucinda. 
But Sylvia yeah, Sessions? Oh. They don't know. You know Sarah's lying about her age because they're like, could be 47, could be 51. We don't know. <laughs> His youngest know. wife was 14, allegedly. Well, they have a 12-year-old. Oh, he, no, he met her at 12. Oh. Yeah, I know. Stupid. Was she dang cooking it? <laughs> Go on. So this, this whole thing, <laughs> this whole polygamy thing is like one of the most controversial things in the Mormon church. Like, because it is in their doctrine, all the bishops, all the stake presidents, all that stuff are in on this. And so it's really hard to pinpoint if it's true or not, but there's no credible evidence to actually state that he ever, you only have what the church is saying, but there's no viable evidence of that happening. Um, so that's the conspiracy going on. And I can't say that it's not, true or it is true what i'm actually just saying is like this is this is what is in the victim statement that this is being traced all the way back to oliver crowdery which was the second person of the lds religion who was baptized into the lds religion and how this has been traced all the way from the beginning family to family and the operations of this lds church of satan they claim that the the way that it's set up is in a way where you have stake presidents involved, you have bishops, you have um, uh, county Utah County attorney, you have David Levitt who was involved in this. You have all these very powerfully positioned people, and they're positioned strategically within the church as well as within society, so that. When any of this stuff happens, they are easily positioned into a a spot where they can, uh, you know, counter or I mean, they can. Um, oh, what I'm trying to say, they can intercept that and prevent it from getting, you know, either exposed or the person getting charged for their crimes and all that kind of stuff. Because if you look at, and this is where you start to piece all of these little pieces together because um, Curtin and McConkey is the law firm for the LDS, for the Latter-day Saints, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, okay, in Utah. And this is very well known. This has been documented, but McConkey, he basically set up this task force for uh, child abuse victims within the LDS church. And he created a hotline for the children. And he basically told the children, you know, don't call the police when you have abuse, you know, when you've had abuse, call this hotline and report your abuse. And oh, what he was- this, yeah. story, this story was crazy. Yeah. This story this, is yeah. nuts and disgusting. Disgusting. Yes. And I mean, ultimately what was happening was like these people would call and he would take these cases and just give them off to be dismissed in court because he, he, there were so many people who were involved in this from not being, you know, going through and it was like protecting these victims that these cases would just get dismissed and then they could never be tried again in court. And so you also look at the Boy Scouts of America, okay? The Boy Scouts of America had 82,000 reports of child abuse that that have actually been like proven okay and that's why the boy scouts of america is like pretty much nobody hears about it anymore Shut and nobody even down. wants to put their kid in it right and with the boy scouts of america in the beginning the mormon church required all, all boys within the mormon religion to go through the boy scouts of america Ooh, wow okay so so one third of the Boy Scouts of America was Mormon and it was actually a requirement. And it wasn't until all this stuff happened with the Boy Scouts of America that they were like, Oh, you know, shit, our, our shit's getting exposed. We got to back out. So, so they stopped that whole, that whole like requiring their children to go through the Boy Scouts of America. So, so weird, are, would you, bro. would you say, I mean, would you say a lot of the scout leaders were obviously Mormon or into that stuff? Because if you're sending them there, it's because someone's asking for them. I mean, not all of them. Cause obviously like yeah, yeah, obviously, Boy yeah. Scouts of America was like a haven for predators, right? Because they protect, they didn't want any abuse allegations to get out. So it was just like a haven for predators. Um, 
because they didn't want people to be like, oh, I can't put my kid in here because they'll get abused. So yep. they, they covered up a lot of this stuff. But the LDS church, ironically, it's like they find these these places where it's like protecting what they're doing. Yes. Like and then the they Vatican. require these. Yes. And so they knew that the Boy Scouts of America is like a great place to to do this because they're not going to get caught because they're not doing anything about these uh, abuse cases. So it's like one, yeah, a lot of the people who are in charge of it were also people of the LDS church. Um, a lot of the members who were, you know, uh, the leaders, like the camp leaders and stuff like that. And then there's also, and I will just say this in 1990 there, I don't know if you guys have ever heard about the pace memo, but Glenn Pace, who is a bishop um, at the LDS church, he starts getting all of these claims. And ironically, this is during the satanic panic era. So obviously, all these people are going to start coming forth and talking about how they were being ritualistically abused in this satanic organization. He gets like so many children coming forth and so many people coming forth saying that they were baptized with blood Jeez. at eight years old into this satanic cult that was operating within the LDS church. And it was to counter their Mormon baptism and and then basically like recruit them into Lucifer's army. And he decides, he's like, you know, I got to investigate this. So what he does is he interviews like 60 different people. He interviews like stake presidents, bishops, you know, leaders, uh, uh, women leaders, like all these people within the church. And he comes to the conclusion that, yes, there is this secret satanic group that is ritualistically abusing people um, and that he, that it's, it is there. So you need to be aware of it and you need to protect your children and sends this pace memo out to all of the Mormon congregations, like to tell them that there is this, organization happening right and basically a lot of the mainline lds just kind of chalked it off as just being super sensational because they can't fathom themselves being a part like they've never had it happen to them and so they think that this is just it was just like super sensationalized and didn't believe it and so he the bishop also just decided never even to go to the police about you know what he had discovered until later when the police actually came to him and interviewed him when they started, you know, getting into this case um, with all this like ritual abuse stuff. And so that pace memo, it's like you have all these little dots that start pointing to something. You have the bountiful Utah case that, you know, came out during the, the 1980s as well. And that had a lot of the same sensational accusations that are in line with what was reported in the victim statements with the David Hamlin case, which ironically was going on sim simultaneously at the same time. Um, and it included, and they were talking about how they were being transported to uh, all these other LDS members houses for abuse and that their parents were involved and, you know, that there were multiple other members of the LDS church involved. And when these, people or when these children came out and talked about this in the bountiful Utah case, the Neil Maxwell who was in charge advised them to just forgive their abusers and move on. What a and so, back. yeah. And so you have this, you have these policies that are in place at the, in the LDS church and you have all these people who are strategically positioned within the LDS church to, make sure that these institutional policies remain and it's all set up and used as a protection for abusers. And so it's like a haven for, for abusers. And if there's going to be this organization that's operating, you know, that's a great place to set up camp is within something that's going to be able to protect you in all aspects, you know, from the top down. Just and so, there's this, there's so many elements that just kind of when I hear all these cases, I'm like, that reminds me a, a lot of what I'm reading in these victim statements and how everything is orchestrated and operated. 
with the Ruby Frank case, one of her victims came on and she, well, not one of her victims, but one of her family members who was so terrified to come on camera and speak that she had her, her voice changed and she also had uh, her face distorted. And you could hear even still the terror in her voice through the distortion. And she basically was like, she said, I, it doesn't surprise me that Ruby Frank was abusing her children because this isn't, this is a, a, a generational thing. And when the reporter was like, you know, was it your parents or whatever? And she was like, the way she described it, this is what stuck out, stood out to me the most was that she goes, it wasn't just our parents. If, if you take the family tree, right, all the way from the trunk to the, you know, from the bottom and all the branches that are included in the family tree, that's how far this generational abuse goes. Jeez. And that's what, that's what she said in the Ruby Frank case, which is going on, you know, out of, it, it's in Provo, Utah, it's Spring City, the same exact area where David Hamblin, you know, just got arrested. And one thing I wanted to point out too, uh, before like we wrap this story up is that Rizel, the wife, okay, remember how I said that she didn't remember any of this abuse had even occurred? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. David Hamblin gets arrested in March of 2022. The, the reports, the press conference that came out basically insinuated that David Hamblin is just the first of many arrests that will come, okay? In, insinuating that there's going to be a lot more people who are going to be prosecuted. And just last month, Rizel, I just saw something pop up that Rizel finally has been arrested for child abuse. So they're slowly picking people off. And and there are so many alleged members in this that I have dived into and dissected and gone deep into their history, their family genealogy, and how it all correlates to each other. And it, it's actually mind-blowing because if you just look at the surface level of these victim statements, it's easy to chalk it off as not being true until you go and, and actually like research what they're saying and find actual evidence that can support it's their crazy. claims. It's crazy. It's just unbelievable. It is crazy. And you know, it is nuts. Now we got to wrap it up, but I thought David Lee had a weird nickname or was it somebody else? Who's I like couldn't Ducky? find it. I looked it up. I, can... I thought it was like the Punisher or something like that. Somebody. So, it's not the Punisher because the Punisher is Lee Benyon. So there are certain roles within the uh, the Church of Satan. In the High Council, you have the Deceiver, you have the the Peacemaker, you have the Punisher, you have um, multiple other roles, and each one is, has a specific. How do you spell you know, his last role. name? Can I just ask you really quickly? What are what are your what are our sources for the, like the name like the title? How do we know that? Is that is that I, I'm really curious about? What, have people escaped the church and like ratted on it? What, what's yeah. the story there? These are all very specifically detailed in the victim statements. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm fascinated. So all by that. that stuff that I'm getting, like, all I'm just the curious about the titles, especially. That's so weird that they have those creepy titles. I mean, isn't that bizarre? And, and Lee, yeah, is so Lee Benyon a man or a woman? What's that? Is Lee Benyon a man or a woman? It's a, a man. And an interesting thing about Lee Benyon. Okay. How I'm do just you spell say his last because, name? N N I O N. Okay. He's out of Utah. He has a pottery shop. So this is the interesting thing about Lee Benyon is because in the w vi victim statements, he's included as being part of this Church of Satan, and he's actually the one who's been identified as the Punisher. The Punisher in the Church of Satan is actually somebody... I'll kill this somebody... motherfucker. I ain't even kidding, dude. <laughs> oh, I'll kill the, this motherfucker. The Punisher is the worst role because they're the ones who commit these torturous, crazy, heinous acts at the... Uh, discretion of the high council so if somebody's acting out of line in the church of satan there's so many parameters that al that are allegedly set up in this organization to keep church of satan members in line and to make sure that this organization operates elusively 
And what I will say too about just even the human sacrificing and the rituals where you go, well, if they're, you know, sacrificing all of these children, then how are they getting away with that? There has to be evidence. You know, people should have been able to find that this is happening or children are missing or whatever. But in this church of Satan, they're not taking children off the street and bringing them in and use, utilizing them as, you know, a sacrifice. What they're doing, and this is what the the victim said, is that they go to these uh, Native American um, reservations uh-huh. or, you know, people who are part of these reservations yep. as well as these polygamy groups yep. where these children aren't documented. They don't have birth oh. certificates, social security numbers, or any of that kind of stuff. And they do oh, trades with game, them. Um, and they sell artwork. They they do like financial trades. And, you know, there's also Church of Satan members that reside within there in those organizations. And they give these children to them. And when you have family that's involved, you think, well, if a child goes missing, then the mom and dad are going to speak up. They're in on it. But in this, it's like a whole family thing. And it's so, so dark. You know what that reminds yeah. me of? It reminds me of the, the finder's cult. Remember yes. how they found those kids and the kids didn't know what the kind of was going on and it's like it was all just, tied to the yeah. CIA. You just don't put them the in the system. The CIA. You just don't put them in the system. A woman can give birth and she don't have to go the kid don't have to doesn't have to go in the system. He can be sold. Exactly. And nobody knows about the children being alive and so they she can She had a get- miscarriage. She had a miscarriage. Easy. Yeah, exactly. And the Lee Benyon thing I was going to say on that is that in the victim statement, they talk a lot about in the ceremonies, they put their hands up and they create this why. And the why has a specific meaning. I can't exactly remember what it is, but um, there's some magical power to this why. And when you look up Lee Benyon's pottery, there's a giant why. Is, that and is, he hasn't been arrested? No. Oh, bro. Um, and there's this giant why, and apparently they use his pottery uh, in the ceremonies. And so I just, I thought that was so interesting when you look at his pottery, there's whys on his pro- pottery. And he's, he's very much like, you know, very particular on placing that why on his pottery. But what I will also say is that there is a lot of claims and allegations within these victim statements that the police should be able to follow up on to find some other credible evidence that gives claims to this because allegedly they were told that they had to document all of their abuse in journals. All the children had to do that. They had to create a journal of abuse and then they also had to create a fake journal of a fake life without abuse so that if they ever got caught, you know, they had a a journal that basically says a life that never happened there was no abuse oh and then wow. they have the journal that has all of the abuse that's in there and they they gave strict parameters on what could be said in there and and all that kind of stuff and so i'm thinking like if there's all these children who have journals there has to be journals somewhere right so it's like there's all of these little pieces where you read this and you go they can't hide all of this stuff you know how can they hide all of this information? Why doesn't the police go and find those types of things? Why are they just focusing on, did this person get abused? I'm just going to whatever, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I don't know if it's just because this is so extensive. This would basically like, it would be like going against some of the most powerful power structures that are out there that they're just kind of like, nah, don't want to use my resources towards that. I'm just going to deal with this. I don't think I want to go up against that. I don't know what it is. But apparently with this case, this is the reason why I've been paying attention to it so much is because slowly but surely, they're still working on this case behind the scenes. I've been keeping up with the court dates and what's going on there. And if we start seeing even more people getting arrested, that's what's going to get like, you know, because you had David Hamblin, then you had Roselle. There's a lot more people mentioned in there. David Levitt, who was the Utah County attorney there, he was named in it. And, you know, there's a whole story, backstory on him, but he basically dipped to Scotland and built or bought a castle. And now he's just hanging out in Scotland with his wife. And it was just odd timing that he decides he's going to dip out to Scotland. And 
then also he's tied to the Nicholas Rossi. I don't know if you guys know Nicholas Rossi, the person who um, pretended or he was he raped somebody in Utah and then he fled to Scotland and and uh, said that he was somebody else. And when they found him, he he was pretending to be somebody completely different. I don't know if you guys heard about that case. No, I haven't. That's a crazy case in and of itself. But he finally just got extradited here. And it turns out that he was Nicholas Rossi. But Nicholas Rossi, before he got caught, basically went on camera and told David, uh, told everybody that David Levitt was part of some satanic ritual abuse thing that was abusing children. And so there's just so many bizarre little elements to this case that yeah. just like keep connecting. It's, it's, it's weird. It's, it's sad. And it's tragic. And, uh, I mean, there, there, there is no, no worse sin than to hurt a child. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm very, 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 very vocal, you know, because I live in a, a town where I'm in a industry where like people are more afraid to say racial slurs than to do jokes about, about hurting children. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's the only edgy thing left. So that's what they do now because kids can't cancel people. So I think it's all, I mean, dude, this guy upsets me. You're talking me. about in comedy, right? In comedy, yes. Not just on the street. No, not on, well, stuff. probably on the street too. Yeah, I but mean, I mean, people you know, shouldn't be doing either. Though. Yeah, I mean, well, they shouldn't be doing on either the street, of them, but one is way worse <laughs> than the other. I'm sorry, bro. I mean, yeah, like, I just meany sure we're... words are meany. I get it, and the, the history of it is pretty gross. I do, and I'll say it again, this is Sam speaking, the N-word is a giant psyop to get us all to fight with each other. Not saying anyone should or shouldn't say it, but it's like the, the, the fine print that comes with that word is perfect for causing divide and conquer okay and it is a perfect version of the inverse the inverted world we live in you know where you take this word that's supposed to be for kings out of africa you invert it to slavery then you invert it again that now you're protecting it at all costs it is the giant inverse so that's it. One more time. Tell them where they can find you. This has been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful podcast. I'd ag- I mean, the, the 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 subject matter is disgusting, but you did a great job of get, uh, disseminating information, Avery. So tell them where they can find you again. So I am. you can find me on Rockfin. Um, that's where, if you guys are interested in this case and you guys um, want to know actually more details, because I go into the alleged... Vi- the alleged members of it. I go through detailed of the mythology of the LDS church. I go into a lot of more detail. Um, I have about four episodes out right now, have a lot more coming. So you can watch the full episodes on my premium Rockfin channel, Chiller Queen podcast. I do 15 minute previews on my YouTube channel, which is Chiller Queen podcast. Um, obviously, I don't think I can post the full episodes on YouTube because it is pretty dark, but you can find it, the full episodes on Rockfin. Um, and then also the Chiller Queen podcast. You can listen on any podcast platform. You can also find me online, social media, and you can also go to my website, chillerqueenpodcast.com. And then you, I also have my personal account, which gets a little bit crazy, but it's a very dope cook because I like to, I like to cook, but I'm also known to cook with cannabis. So I'm a dope cook. So <laughs> respect, that, respect. <laughs> <laughs> so those are all the places that you can find me. Well, it was a great conversation. Glad you could finally meet your idol. Uh, <laughs> yes. Johnny. I mean, Johnny, I, love to, no. I love to make so dreams good. come true. That's what we do. Uh, great podcast. Uh, a sad uh, topic, but wonderful uh, information to get out. And hopefully people will, you know, make sure that they, uh, they, they, I mean, if the information is true, that these people are scumbags. And if you see this Benyon guy, throw a shoe at him. Well, we can't do that, attention. but we got to make sure that like there's enough pressure that if there's information that he is who they the yeah, punisher. Yeah, don't don't hit him, just ask him about it. Yeah, ask yeah. him about you know. You can decide if you believe him. Right. Yeah. I mean, we like, got we just can't. pay attention to a lot of these cases that are popping up, you know. Yes. Um yeah. Yes. This has been a great conversation. Guys, if you love this, follow her. The links are below. Make sure you click on all the links and support. Uh, Again, you know, we hope you enjoyed this. Go to samtribly.com. New t-shirts going up all the time. You can get them at 
uh, samtriplee.com. All my videos, you can get them at uh, samtriplee.com. Uh, all my audio, samtriplee.com. Everything, the affiliates, we got more and more great affiliates there. My cameos are fire. Go great way. Uh, discounts on all the affiliates. My social media, which I'm going to start getting into a little bit more, samtriplee.com. Telegram, zeros, all the audio at samtriplee.com. And if you stay tuned, we're going to break down the affiliates and then we're going to get into uh, all the highlights from some of my other shows. Check them out and enjoy the highlights. Here's a clip from the latest Broken Sim. But anyway, so we go there and dude, you ever hang out with shiny people? You mean people who look like they should be celebrities? Like they, like ju- you can just tell they, they're they're happy people. Have you ever seen that? You like, mean like that REM song, "Shiny Happy People." Like I don't, know, Johnny. You live on the west side of LA. That is shiny happy people. Yeah, I kind of know what you mean. People who look like people who people who look like they just got pulled out of Instagram. Basically, is that what they you're saying? they look like they're they're yogis. They do yoga. Where did they you eat send ro- this thing? Uh, to your to your uh, I texted it to you. Um, wait for that then. So and 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 I say this all out love. I mean, this is like they were such nice people. But it turns out he invited all these people that are in the truth community that have been pushing back against the Jacks. So it was really cool, like huge name people. Like okay. I don't know if you know this name, but Del Big Tree was there, and he's the guy uh, who got. Uh, have ran- we had him on? No, but we're setting it up. It's it's so funny because these guys are all serious. They're all doctors. They're all this stuff, yeah. and I'm like, hey, I got a podcast called Tim Fall Hat, <laughs> and I would instantly go, hey, hey, don't um don't don't let the name fool you, right? Do you? I've asked you this before. I know, and I'm just curious if your answer has evolved. Any regrets about choosing that? None. Okay. Actually, proud that I did it. And in <laughs> hindsight, in hindsight, I feel like I feel like that it's the reason. One of the big reasons the show has blown up because people automatically know what the show is. So my plan was, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, right? Because like I always sit down and tell people how to blow up a podcast. I give them four. Di- have we talked about this? Uh, yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You're, you're- so one is like the name of your podcast. They in- instantly have to know what it's about. The video is kind of like. Yeah, I know it's janky, but we don't have to play all of it. But the point is, so I'm going around talking to people. My social anxiety. Is through the roof. The people here are nice. Everyone's nice. They're all doctors. They're all fighting the mandates. It's like a really nice party. Everybody there is really nice. Shiny, happy people. Mickey, remember we kept talking about how good looking Mickey was? You remember like we're like, dude, you are stunningly good looking. People who wouldn't hang out with us unless they had some kind of business reason or like uh, you know, like a, an association. No, like like, like like you know, it's like if 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 I drop my wallet there, I wouldn't be worried that someone would take it. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, because yeah. the biggest scumbag there is me, right? <laughs> like there's places where I'm like, oh, I don't have to lock my car because I'm the I'm the biggest criminal in the neighborhood. <laughs> it's not LA, by the way. Right? Right? So not LA. Not LA. But this was on the west side. And they are all so nice. Del Bill This is from this video you sent yeah, me. Yeah, so so, like, I've never been, like, a Johnny, I have such really insane, insane social anxiety. Like, I, I'm there, dude. Yeah. My mom has it. My brother has it. It's like, we're isolators. I do not like going to events to the point that nobody invites me out anymore, which makes Which is me, weird because you didn't have any trouble. Did you, did you shit yourself on stage early on? No. It's the weirdest thing. That's the only, so, like... I find a place that I'm comfortable with, and I just go there all the time. Like, what do you mean by a like place? Like the comedy like store. I can go to the or, comedy store oh, and feel very comfortable. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, but if I go to the improv, the clock is ticking. How really? Long? Oh, get in, get out, bro. And everyone there is really nice. I have I have none but love for the improv. There, Rita is the nicest person. She's an old friend of mine from a not that she's old. She's uh, she's very young, but I've known her for decades. Okay, wonderful person. Love uh, the staff there is really nice. But the comedy store, maybe because I did a lot of drugs and bad decisions there, I'm very comfortable. My my jokes carried me when I was so scared. I get because, yeah. because what happened, Johnny, was when I started stand up comedy, I had to go in the bars, and at the time, everybody wanted to be. 
And I've heard some really shady shit about over the weekend. That, oh, really? Yeah, I don't want to tell you it. Oh, but I wish I didn't say his name. Can we beep his name? So, you know, everybody thinks beep, beep, beep is like this prim and proper and like corporate clean guy. Well, word was that this comic that's no longer with us told, told this guy that this guy's a real scumbag, that he got off on fucking married women. Really? Yeah, that was his thing. Like when he could find a fan who was married. At least they're women, you know, as opposed to I guess. girls. I guess. Which is what well, we thought I mean, maybe his thing no, was. No, uh, before he got uh, Okay. I, 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 He's I, been there before. You might want to cut out all this, but I found that to be very interesting because I've always said this, Johnny. It's a blind item. They can't say shit about it. Not we didn't name it. all clean comics are assholes, but most asshole comics work clean. It's just this golden rule in comedy. It's kind of like they're so like under pressure. You well, know, it's like, like it's like when you when you do art and you make it business, show business. You move from art to show business. That takes a little bit of your soul out. A little bit. Believe, believe that. Yeah. So, anyways, so I go to this event. I am mind blown by how cool everybody is. I'm how many f- people are there? Would you say twenty? Okay. Was, Did Eddie go? No, Eddie's in Portland tonight. I, don't, I probably had some jujitsu shit. I don't know. Or he's doing stand up. I don't a busy know. Guy. Yeah, he's hustling. So, so we go. I go there. I I meet a couple people. I'm a huge Dell Big Tree fan. I like. I can't believe he's right here. So like, I is don't, that a, is that is he Indian? Is that like an Indian name? No, I'm. Del, look him up. Look him up. Del you'll you'll recognize his face because he was just dropping bombs. About the um, about all that stuff. He was like one of the first ones to get censored on YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this guy. Yeah, yeah. Do we got beep that too? What I just said. Whoa. I said, Jax. I'm sorry, Johnny. You got you. Got, you're working hard. So I I am here. These are doctors. These are medical professionals. And then there's the dick joke comic who's hanging out. Was there anybody in your category there? All right. Not dick joke comics, but I get there and I just meet with these two guys, uh, Deepak and an artist named Twilight, right? Twilight. And, I like that. Yeah. Right. Really cool. So I start connecting. They know who did I he am. Did meet Pasta, Twilight? Did Pasta I, Twilight sorry, pa- Pasta, Twilight, and Deepak. Sitting in a tree, okay? Now you walk into a bar, right? We have Twilight Depot <laughs> and walk into a bar. Um, so we start talking. And so I don't know how deep to go with people in these conversations because everybody in the conspiracy community is only willing to go so far. Like Jimmy Dore, right? In their thing, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Dore will go every, anywhere until I go, oh, we didn't land on the moon. Then I lose him right yeah, there, yeah, yeah. right? And you know, and you know, there's certain people that will talk about certain things. So I have to judge 100%. how deep I can go. So I start talking to these guys, and they're in. Uh, they're in on all of it. We start going deep in the fallen angels and all that shit. It was really cool to have a conversation with them. And That's like, cool, I'm like, so I I feel bad because I'm just cha- walking, following them around everywhere. Did you know that Dell Bigtree worked on Doctor Phil as a field producer? Oh, really? For five episodes. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So so he, he so he's a lot. It's so funny when you do this thing. I call. I like to do a zoom. How tall are they? You, when you see somebody on the yeah, internet, yeah, 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 yeah. and then when you meet them in real life, either they're way taller or way shorter yeah. than you thought. Yeah, totally. Which is hilarious. Totally surprising. He's way taller than I thought. Big tree. Oh yeah, way taller. Oh, man, with a name like big tree. Yeah, you gotta be a big tree. Big tree full. When you're like that tall. So we went there. I found people that were into all of it, the, the Nephilim, all that stuff. We got in a conversation. Pastas, he's into stuff. I don't know how deep he, he goes into that. And um, he's so, so uh, this one doctor is a kind of a celebrity amongst the group. He He's going to leave. He's like saying goodbye to his wife. They're like, hold on. Hold on. Now a clip from Conspiracy Social Club. And I don't know Klaus Schwab, but I'm just going to use him as an example. Yeah. You're making the elites at the World Economic Forum evil baby eaters. And I would say that they are, a lot of them are trying to solve the problems that we're talking Brian, about in real you time. Are, like, Brian, the problem with you, yeah. and there's many, but the biggest <laughs> one is you are so 
Inc- yeah, welcome to Worst Take Ever with Brian Callen. Hey, you want to hear the worst take possible? Let's go. Hey, Hitler made highways. Was he that bad? Next with Brian Callen. Okay. Hey, guys, you guys know Tim Fall Hats for the people. We want people to live a better life and, and get stuff in positive, vibrational stuff in their life. So we want to tell you about some of our, our affiliate programs real quick. We got Wise Wolf, Gold and Silver. If you're looking for precious metals, these are the best in the business. Okay. I'm part of this Wise Wolf package program. I spend a certain amount of money every month and they send me precious metals and I love it. It's a great way to get ready for the financial collapse. We have AquaCure, hydrogen brown gas. Listen, we, we've we've talked about it before. If you want to look younger, it's a great way. Uh, check it out. You click the banner. You use the promo code TINFALLHA. Our friends at Harley Ray Candles and Crystals. Go check it out. If you use Swarm 15, you'll get 15% off. They got candles. They have, uh, what? Uh, click on it real quick. Sage. Sage. Crystals. They got crystals. They got everything you might need. And all you got to do is use the promo. Look at that one right there. I want to get that aqua blue. I should just ask them to send it to us. Aqua blue at uh, $55, $55 promo code Swarm 15, you get 15% off that. Very excited to be you working with Tim James over at Chemical Free Body. That's right. Get 5% off all of his products, everything he's doing with the promo code Tin Foil Hat. I love his vitamins and nutrients. I take them all the time. They are the best and it helps me get my body going. And if you're lo- looking to lose weight, let's say you're, 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 you got, you're a busy dad, busy mom out there, go check out Joel Staley. He's helped me lose weight. Uh, he's got a whole program to lose weight, get in shape, all that stuff. Just click the, the banner and use the promo code Tin fall hat, three words, and you can get shape. It worked for me. It can work for you. Hope you guys enjoy these and uh, check out the highlights. We, we, we go deep, homeboy. Aaron, open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Tim foil hat, Tim foil hat, Tim foil hat.